The great thing about democracy is that if the politicians do something that really hurts us, we can chuck them out. But what if the blame falls on another group of unelected people? The bankers, for instance. What can we do about them? In an hour or so, the latest economic growth figures will be published and they will confirm the picture we've come to recognise in recent months of an economy trapped in the doldrums, likely to stay that way for a long time to come. We're getting poorer. The so-called squeezed middle is being squeezed even harder. And that seems to be feeding a growing disenchantment with the way the financial sector and the bosses of our biggest companies have been behaving, especially the way they've been feathering their own nests at the expense of others. It's a simple fact that the gap between the richest and poorest has grown massively. That disenchantment has found one expression in the Occupy protests outside St Paul's Cathedral and in the United States. But arguably it's felt more broadly too. Its critics say it doesn't have a clear focus. It wants bankers and financiers to be paid less, but it doesn't know how to achieve that. So when we look back on 2011, what chance is there that we'll see it as a watershed year in this respect? What chance that we look at it as a moment when a public mood coalesced to demand reform of the system and in the end, by some means we can't see yet, brought it about? Well, that's the question I shall be addressing now with three people who've been around the course a bit here. One of them is Sir Richard Lambert, who was uh, former uh, Director General of the CBI, the Bosses Union, if you like. He's now Chancellor of Warwick University. Julian Tett, Associate Editor of the Financial Times, their Managing Editor in the United States for a couple of years. And Jeff Mulgan, former CEO of the Young Foundation, and he's uh, held various jobs in Downing Street under various British Prime Ministers. Uh, good morning to you all. Um, let's start with you, Jeff Mulgan, uh, because you were around, well, we all were, I suppose, um, at a time when the trade unions were ruling the roost and the public, many and the, many people at any rate, regarded what they were doing as, as ha- they, they, they were regarded as having their snouts in the trough, to use the most um, crude version of it. And in the end, they were dealt with. Well, back in the 60s and 70s, trade unions made the claim that they were essential to the smooth running of a modern economy. And then, as you say, uh, the mood shifted. They came to be seen as more the problem than the solution. They were seen as too self-serving, too greedy, too powerful, too closely tied into political power. And the mood swung over a period of 10 or 15 years, and they were greatly weakened. I think there are signs that something similar may be happening to the banks. It's happened before in history, when finances, as it were, overshot and become too powerful, and then usually after a financial crash, as in 1929, uh, politicians start turning on them. It happened in the 30s when Roosevelt called them the economic royalists, uh, and the whole swing of policy moves more towards uh, equalisation, and it's mainly about the middle. It's about the interests of the middle rather than the very poor, when the middle no longer see it as in their interest that the very rich become much richer. But do you need somebody, do you need somebody on the white horse, the man, or in case <laughs> this is Thatcher, the woman on the white horse, to lead that assault? Or is it driven from some other source? Well, it certainly needs a a political focus. It needs a public mood. I think the great issue for finance at the moment is that we've... Finance has claimed, justifiably, to be vital for economic growth. The problem now is that large areas of finance have very little to do with the real economy, little to do with funding technology or innovation or new services. The great majority of financial transactions are transactions on other transactions. There's a perception... The banks are not providing good services to uh, ordinary people. They're not serving small businesses which don't have enough choice, enough competition. And almost very little finance of new technology now comes from the banks, investment banks and so on. Yeah, but what is... Sorry, I was going to say, what what does history tell us about how this public mood coalesces? I mean, if, if it's true, as it seems to be, and we'll get into that in a minute, if it's true that we're fed up with that, how does that public mood coalesce into action? Well, it takes quite a time. I mean, remember how long it took for the shift of mood against the trade unions. Mm. Ted Heath tried various things in the early 70s. They didn't really work because trade unions were almost too indispensable to bypass. Uh, And it was another 10 years before Mrs Thatcher really got underway. And even then, she took it very much step by step rather than a full frontal assault on all the unions. And it may be the same will be the case here. We're looking at a a 10 to 20 year process of change, not a one or two year one. Mm. Uh, Richard Lambert. You've said in the past that it won't be self-correcting. That's to say that the bosses, the financiers, the bankers won't look at it themselves and say, yeah, we better back off a bit here. <laughs> 
Uh, well, I think that's right. Uh, but I, I think actually the change is already beginning. Oh? And it's being driven by regulation. Uh, if you look back over the last 10 years, you see that uh, banks took greater and greater and greater risks, and they borrowed more and more against an ever-diminishing pile. Reckless of, risks. Reckless risks, clearly, because uh, they went bust. Um, now regulations are coming in here in the UK and across the European Union and across the world, which will require the banks to be more conservative in the way they run their affairs. And that will mean, because they'll be taking less risk, they'll be taking less returns. And so over time, that ought to mean that there'll be less space for bumper pay awards. Well, why? Because if they're not being paid by results, as manifestly they are not being, I mean, had they been paid by results, they'd all be in the poorhouse by now, or at least a very large proportion of them. Why would regulation? Why would it, well, unless it was specifically aimed at that at remuneration, and that's a terribly difficult thing to do in the private sector. Why would that? Well, work? How I, think, would that work? I think two things. One is that uh, that during the sort of bubble years, their ratio of debt to their shareholders and funds rose from about fifteen to about. 30 or 40, or in some cases 50, that meant that they were making enormous returns. They were taking enormous risk, enormous returns. Uh, now those ratios won't be allowed to happen again. But they're so, still pay, paying themselves. Well, some, the, 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 in some sectors where they're trading with each other, they're still making very large sums of money. The returns are... It's, going, it's not going to be a great business to be in over the next 10 years. The other thing is that the regulators can say, and I think there's a strong argument that they should say, you know, because banks are sh short of capital, then from now on you jolly well not, will not pay out bonuses. Instead, you'll do it, use the, that, that money to reinforce your capital. And the regulators are beginning to talk that way. And, and uh, yeah, Gillian, give, give us uh, an American perspective on this, because they seem, the pub public mood seems to be a bit sharper, a bit angrier than it is here. Well, it is and it isn't. But um, I think it's worth doing what Jeff was suggesting and stepping back and looking at it from a historical perspective. Because one of the most fascinating bits of research I saw this year was by two economists called Filip Reshev that looks at banking sector pay since 1900. And what's fascinating is that if you go back to the period between 1900 and 1929, um, back then financial sector pay relative to non-financial sector pay rose from 1 to 1.7 times for the same level of education. So doctors versus bankers. Then, and this is a key point, after the Wall Street crash, about five years after that, it really fell right back. And after the post-World War II period, you had two or three decades where bankers and doctors were basically paid about the same. Mm. And it wasn't until the 70s or 80s that actually the financial sector suddenly exploded again in terms of its pay. To me, the fascinating thing is that Filip Onoreshev said that in 2007, you had the same ratio as in 1929. The question, though, is what's going to happen next. Because if history replays itself, what Richard says is quite correct. As regulation comes in, you may see the financial sector shrink and you may start to see bankers paid more normally. Is but go on. We just don't know yet. We're still Remember, back in 1929, it took about five years before you began to have the full impact of regulation really follow through to the banking sector. Isn't the big difference now, though, is... We live in a global world. I mean, global in the sense that if you talk to a banker here about how much he's earning, he said, well, I'm earning 10 billion, but I could earn 20 billion if I go to Hong Kong or something. Two big issues. One is we live in a globalised world. And so, as you just said, you do have um, competition across borders. Secondly, we live in a digitised world where you have extraordinary technological power, which basically creates and growing gaps between the haves and have nots and people who have the ability to control technology and those who don't. So perhaps this time round, history won't replay itself. But if you go back to 1929, 1930s, then it's possible to see that there are times of extraordinary change. And frankly, back in 1928, it would have been very hard for people to conceive of the scale of change that then occurred in the subsequent two or three decades. What Richard is saying may be just correct. Maybe, just maybe, we are on the verge of a tipping point when we could see extraordinary upheavals in the next two or three decades, which right now are very hard to imagine, because we think that what happened in the last three decades was normal, and history suggests that, frankly, it was anything but. Is that what history suggests to you, Jeff? Yes, and I think there's two things perhaps to watch out for in the next five or ten years. Richard's right that the banks are being were tied down by new regulations and requirements, but perhaps the more strategic issue will be whether governments encourage much more competition, new competition to the banks, uh, and whether they make much more use of new technologies to bypass the bank's position, offering different kinds of financial service uh, and product. And that may, may be the way we end up with a much better uh, sort of financial system, much more aligned with people's needs, rather than a small number of extremely powerful powerful uh, bodies essentially claiming that they're too big to fail, they're indispensable, they can't be touched. Do you sense the, the anger, the 
it palpably existed, at least I remember it existing, perhaps I got it wrong, against the trade unions, or some trade union leaders specifically, um, a few decades ago. Do you sense that today against the bosses? Well, I think repeatedly through history, institutions become very powerful and too powerful. It happened to the church in the Middle Ages. It's happened to the military in many countries. For a time, they're seen as indispensable. And then people do become very angry at them. They are seen as as, as greedy, <laughs> self-serving, acting against the interests of the public. I think we haven't yet quite got to the degree of anger that we may well see perhaps after another turn of the economic cycle, perhaps if GDP really does fall 5 or 10% next year and people's lives become much more stretched and strained, then they will really be looking for someone to blame. But, but even if that happens, Richard Lambert, what your erstwhile colleagues will say is we contribute a huge amount to the national economy. What, 10%? Is it the financial sector? Eight, something like that, yeah. yeah. Mm. You, can't, you can't manage without us. You need us. Well, I think I would also be talking about people at the other end of the income scale. I mean, I think if one's talking about income inequality, a thing to look at first, from my point of view, is people at the bottom end of the scale. The income inequality in the UK increased most rapidly during the 80s and 90s when we lost all those mid-level manufacturing jobs. And I think we should be thinking, as well as the excesses at the top end, of uh, the deprivation at the lower end, thinking about how to get better paid jobs, how to get better skills, how to get better public services to the people at the bottom end of the scale. Because, you know, that's, if, if, if you can lift at one end, that, that's a major contribution to making things better. I, could, I frankly couldn't agree more. I mean, there are parts of the UK right now which are absolutely bleeding and suffering in terribly harrowing ways. Um, and um, for my money, I think the two big themes for the next year are going to be what I call the two Cs. Credit, in the Latin sense. I mean, do we trust governments? Do we trust banks? Do we trust people who actually are in charge of us? And then cohesion, in the sense of, do we actually have the ability as a society to allocate pain and still stick together? Because the reality is, we you know, we're over leveraged. There's too much debt. There's going to have to be some pain allocated. And the key question that politicians are finding it very hard to talk about is, how are they going to allocate that pain? Is it going to be allocated by default? Are they going to be proactive? And can we do it in a way that remains equitable and ensures that everyone continues to buy into society? All right, Jeff, Jeff Mann, a very quick thought on that because you spend a lot of time in Number 10. Are the politicians able to, quite, quite apart from whether they are up for it or not, are they able to do that? I think it's quite difficult, and we shouldn't underestimate the influence of finance on the political parties. Exactly. They are the main funders of the parties. But I think what the others have said is right. Finance has to move from being a sort of source of vast profit to being a service to the rest of society and the economy. And the great issue is going to be jobs. Because we're now recognising that even through some of the boom years, both uh, the US and the UK weren't really generating sufficient new jobs of sufficient quality. And that's where political attention is going to turn. But you all accept that there is a great and growing anger, or am I putting words into your mouth? Very quick thought on that, Gillian. I couldn't agree more. Credit and cohesion are the two key issues. Three-fifths, 65% of people are angry about the subject, the poll show. <laughs> and yet, we seem to be happy as well at the same time. We're resigned. We're resigned. We're resilient. We're <laughs> <laughs> it's the blitz spirit. It's the blitz spirit. There we are.